Good morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Tuesday, May the 2nd, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Peace talks are proposed for Sudan combatants in Saudi Arabia. The two parties have already declared ceasefire six times, but have observed none of the ceasefires in a complete way. This time, I hope that they would be more inclined to abide by their commitment. Liberian President George Weah sacks his Minister of Postal Affairs, but critics cry political retaliation. We will look at press freedom and censorship in Nigeria as the world prepares to mark Press Freedom Day tomorrow, Wednesday. The ruling Sierra Leone People's Party plans to officially endorse incumbent President Julius Madabio today, Tuesday. For Alienians might disagree on many things. The one thing they have a consensus on is that President Bill has done a lot of heavy lifting. He has literally punched above his weight in this first five years of his administration. And a Ugandan cartoonist uses social media to highlight poor health care in the country. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. A Sudan expert says any ceasefire in the Sudan conflict must guarantee a mechanism to monitor the Sudanese army and the Rapid Support Forces Militia, the RSF. Suleiman Baldo, the director of Sudan Transparency and Policy Tracker, says the combatants must be required to allow the delivery of desperately needed humanitarian supplies. This comes after news reports late Monday said that the warring parties have agreed to send their representatives to another country potentially Saudi Arabia for negotiations. The report say the talks would focus on stable and reliable ceasefire to be monitored by national and international observers. Baldo tells me that it is welcome news given that both sides have repeatedly violated previous truces. Well, this is an, an interesting development, let's say, and uh, let's keep hopeful that this time it will work. The two parties have already declared ceasefire six times, but have observed none of the, of the ceasefires in a complete way. You know, there were always violations and fighting. This time, I hope that the fact that they are meeting face-to-face in Saudi Arabia, which has a lot of leverage on both parties, they would be more inclined to abide by their commitment to observe a ceasefire. My second observation is that a ceasefire needs to have a proper mechanism for monitoring and identification of violations and, uh, you know, some form of uh, pressures on the parties so that they stick to their commitments and not just make, uh, you know, media statements that, that they are observing ceasefires. So let's hope it will work this time. I'm sure now after the ceasefire there comes uh, a more deeper discussion in terms of the future of the country, where do you think they should be looking now? I believe first thing, you know, it should come first. You know, we need first for the fighting to stop and to stop seriously, not with running battles between the two parties in Khartoum and across Sudan, in Darfur and elsewhere. And this is not yet the case. We need to ensure that there is a ceasefire that falls, a ceasefire mechanism for monitoring and and separation of forces. And once we have the assurances that the parties are serious enough about ending the actual combat, they should also be required to grant humanitarian access for desperately needed humanitarian supplies, safe corridors for humanitarian workers and for uh, engineers who want to fix the water stations that have been bombed, depriving millions, uh, you know, in Khartoum, the the, the large capital, from healthy supply of uh, water, municipal water, Uh, also fixing electric grid so that people can get some electricity, Uh, improving the health response, which is on the verge of collapse as we speak, All of these are things that cannot wait for any further uh, delay would mean that people will be dying in Sudan as we speak. And once, you know, we have a ceasefire and humanitarian response that is tangible and, and massive by the size of the disaster itself, I believe that talks should start on the political dispensation in the post-conflict. And that's a very delicate phase that people should prepare for, for, but 
it must be made clear to these two generals that there are consequences for the, their joint violations of international humanitarian law. Before I let you go, uh, Suleiman, the, the former Prime Minister Hamdok, uh, said uh, over the weekend uh, that he thinks there should be a defined role for the military. They should not engage in politics. Well, this was where Sudan was heading with the political process that uh, this war has uh, prevented from uh, finalizing which is the exit of the military uh, from the political life. You know, I believe that the supporters of the former regime in Geneva, they did this to prevent the political process from concluding and to pave the way for the return to power. Suleiman Baldo is the director of Sudan Transparency and Policy Tracker. He was speaking with us from New Jersey. In Sierra Leone, the governing Sierra Leone People's Party, SLPP, plans to officially endorse incumbent President Julius Madabio as its candidate in the capital Freetown today, Tuesday. This comes as the Electoral Commission prepares to administer the coming June 24 general election. President Bio is seeking his second and final five-year term in the presidential election. He is suspected to be challenged by main opposition leader and former Foreign Minister Samura Kamara from the main opposition APC. For more about Tuesday's formal declaration for the president's re-election, VOS Peter Clotty, Rich Information Minister Mohamed Rachman Swari. I mean, for Alienians might disagree on many things. The one thing they have a consensus on is that President Bill has done a lot of heavy lifting. He has literally punched above his weight in this first five years of his administration. The people have given testimonies on how he has been able to touch their lives, ranging from um, his introduction of equality in, in education, free school means. Um, in the last couple of days, we have had um, Honorable Alpha Kanu, my immediate predecessor in the Ministry of Information and Communications, um, who had also been Minister of Mines and Mineral Resources, uh, Political and Public Affairs Minister, Senior Advisor to the President, and many more, you know, declaring for His Excellency um, in Poloko with a large chunk of supporters. Apart from that, we are in Kono today, where the biggest of all the fishes did an official declaration. Honorable Dr. Victor Bokari Fo, who is reputed for having been um, the strategist for the APC, bringing them back from um, obscurity and oblivion to governance. Some Sierra Leoneans are saying these endorsements appear to be a publicity exercise for the president that what he has done appears to be good and that the economy is not doing well and that uh, there are challenges that have yet to be resolved and that gives the opposition the chance to even defeat him in the upcoming election. What, what's your response to that? Well, anybody who says that is not quite okay with um, the reality of Sierra Leone politics. The president has at no point stated that everything is hunky-dory. We know there are challenges. His Excellency has been able to do many things, even in the midst of COVID and the twin shocks, right? He was able to give direct cash transfers to people, um, to the poorest of the poor during lockdowns. He was able to um, implement a quick actual economic recovery program to ensure that we did not run short of basic essential commodities. He was able during the same period to pay salaries to hotel workers who were the hardest hit by COVID. And a whole lot of other things. He launched the Monafa Fund, which was a fund to support small medium enterprises and tax deferrals who are given to importers. And he made special credit line, direct credit line available to commercial banks for utilization by importers. Will Sierra Leonean see free, fair, transparent and credible elections come June 24? Well, so it is, it is President Bill himself who had, who had first declared that. I mean, it's quite unusual for Sierra Leonean leaders to declare electoral calendar way in advance. President Bill declared um, this year's election date way in advance of the election, almost a year in advance. Before now, we are aware of instances where the international community had to plead with incumbents, where various civil society groups had to put pressure so that they could talk um, either after me and me campaign or senior elongation maneuverings. President Bill does not want that. He wants to give everybody a fair chance, right, in a free and fair, transparent pool, which is sure to win anyway, because the writings are all over the place, even for the blind to see. So what we are seeing across the country is enough to warn those who need warning that these elections, the outcome of these elections cannot be toyed with, 
and to reassure majority of Sierra Leoneans that President Bill will be given another opportunity to continue serving our great country. Our Sierra Leone's Information Minister Mohamed Rachman Suarez speaking with viewers Peter Colotti from the capital of Freetown. Liberian President George Weah has fired the country's Post and Telecommunications Minister, Cooper Krua. Last Friday, Krua attended the ceremony at which former Vice President Joseph Boakai picked Senator Jeremiah Kong as his vice presidential running mate for the October 2023 elections. The Postal Affairs Minister and Kong are both from Neighbor County, and they are members of the Movement for Democracy and Reconstruction Party of Senator Prince Johnson. Senator Johnson tells me the sacking of Minister Krua is political retaliation by President George Weah. I had told this, my minister, a long time ago, when we pulled out, I said to him, Carly, resign on your own. You cannot be a national chairperson of the Movement for Democracy and Reconstruction, MDR, opposed now to Georgia government. Then at the same time, you are a minister, a cabinet minister in the very government that we oppose. They will not take it lightly. So please resign. And uh, if you are listening to me, you would have resigned ever since. Even this gone Sunday, I think yesterday, I called him to my office, the church office, and I called a few members of the Deacon Board to advise him to resign. And he promised to resign by this week, presumably on Wednesday or Thursday. He was packing his team from the office and preparing his document of resignation. But... For me, I don't think it was proper for him to have gone to the executive mansion to talk to the newly appointed minister of state, informing him that he should tell the president that he, Honorable Cooper Crow, the minister of post and telecommunication, will be resigning this week. Senator, the way you sound, it seems that only the people who work for the government must be supporters of the president. But that's the way, Mr. Chilos, we are wanted. That's his style of leadership. In the case of Madam Sali, our administration, she a minister where she had opposition. She had Eugene Nagbe from the CDC. She had Louis Brown from the MPP. And uh, even uh, Natalia Magui worked also in her government. She never dismissed them. She brought opposition. Let me ask you, Senator Johnson, your junior senator from Nimba County was uh, selected by uh, former Vice President Joseph Buaka as his running mate for the 2023 presidential election. What do you make of that? Well, you know, like I told you earlier, the MDR is a political party registered under the law of the Republic of Liberia with incorporators from the 15 countries. And so the party is open to forming alliance, forming merger or collaboration or coalition. So it's no problem for me to see uh, the Unity Party choosing our political leader, uh, Senator Cole, as a running mate. It's a good news for the youth in the republic. He represents the youth. It's a good news for the people of Nimba County. It's a good news for development. It's a good news for the Liberian people who want to see a real fight against drug importation. And it's a good news for all Liberians who do not want to see Liberia be used as a drug transit point. People say that uh, you had your thumb on that uh, selection. You influence it. What do you say? No, it's not possible, Mr. Botti. I did not manipulate anything, no. I did not influence anything, no. I've never been part of any meeting that led to his, his choosing, rather. Senator Prince Johnson, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. God bless you, Jimmy. That was Senator Prince White Johnson of Liberia speaking with us from the capital, Monrovia. Liberia's Information Minister Ledger Hood Renin says President George Weah has the constitutional right to appoint and dismiss government officials appointed by him. On Monday, President Weah sacked Post and Telecommunication Minister Cooper Krua. Last Friday, Krua attended the ceremony at which former Vice President Joseph Boakai picked Senator Jeremiah Kong as his vice presidential running mate for the October 2023 elections in which Weah is seeking re-election. Some some of his critics called the sack in political retaliation. Information Minister Rennie tells me the suggestion of political retribution is absurd because the president is simply exercising his constitutional powers. What they are saying is uh, can best be described as uh, absurdity because the president does not have 
to retaliate against anybody because of their political affiliation in the country. All of us who are cabinet ministers and members of the executive serve at the pleasure of the president provided for under Article 54, 55, and 56 of the Liberian Constitution. So the president can hire at will and dismiss at will provided for by law. And just that alleged who is the timing. Well, the timing does not matter. The, the Constitution provides that any time the president can exercise that constitutional authority, that which he has. So whether it's because somebody went to a political party rally yesterday, and the next day they get fired, then it's true as a, a political retaliation, that's left to conjecturing. But the president has that constitutional authority to act, and he does not have to consult anyone at any time. So at the end of the day, it is his decision and it's his action. In keeping with law, I must act. Now, the new minister, where is he from? The new minister, as far as I know, is from Nimba County. He served in government before, and he has a wealth of experience of running government. So I'm sure he brings, uh, you know, a wealth of experience to the table. And uh, we'll see exactly how it goes. Leji, thank you very much again. A pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Leji Hureni is Liberia's information minister. He was speaking with us from the capital of Monrovia. A Nigerian female journalist and independent publisher says that some media organizations in the country practice self-censorship. The publisher, who spoke on the 30th anniversary of World Press Freedom Day this Wednesday, says such practice is caused by fear of intimidation and harassment by the powers that be. Maureen Chibo is the publisher of the Real News magazine online and president of the Guild of Corporate Online Publishers of Nigeria. Chibo spoke to reporter Mike Mbonyan about the 30th anniversary of the World Press Freedom Day. World Press Freedom Day is, uh, is important, is significant in, um, in uh, currently support for journalists whose uh, job has become very difficult um, these days. In all climes, uh, you find out uh, that journalists are under threat, journalists are intimidated, journalists are stopped from doing their job, uh, they are muzzled in, uh, in different ways you can imagine. Some of them have been killed just because they wrote the truth. And as the theme of this, this year's um, project, um, press freedom is the lifeblood of all human rights. And if the journalist, if the press is stopped from doing its job, then the freedom of all human beings are also under threat. Democracy will be under threat. The freedom for people to move about and say the truth to government is, is, will be muzzled. Uh, and authoritarianism will be planted in the society. So it's important that on this day that, that um, everybody moves to support the journalists to do their work uh, without fear, without intimidation. Their own part, journalists must also strive to uh, work in accord with the tenets of the profession by making sure that they report the truth and that they are objective in all their reportage as can be so that they will not give reason to those in power to threaten them, to intimidate them, and to muzzle them or stop them from doing their job. One of the aims and objectives of the World Press Freedom Day is the defense of the media from attacks on their independence. What's the situation in Nigeria? Uh, the situation in Nigeria is not different from uh, what obtains in other climes. There is intimidation, there is uh, harassment, and... Uh, some journalists have been arrested, and then, um, and uh, there is also the worst aspect of what is happening is uh, self censorship. Because when there is self censorship, uh, it's as a result uh, of uh, it's an in result of uh, intimidation and harassment, and journalists not wanting to uh, step on the toes of the powers that be. So, with self censorship, you see that most media houses will not be publishing what they ought to publish. They will not be investigating what they ought to investigate out of fear that if they should publish, they will be damned. That was Maureen Chibo, publisher of Real News Magazine Online. She spoke with reporter Michael Bonye on the telephone from Lagos, Nigeria.
A popular cartoonist in Uganda has launched a social media campaign to highlight the poor state of the country's health care system. At Uganda Health Exhibition on Twitter is telling stories about the poor conditions in hospitals and clinics. Uganda's Ministry of Health has disputed the allegations, as Halima Atumani reports from Kampala. Pictures of Ugandan doctors treating patients on the floors of hospitals because of a lack of beds have this week been circulating on social media. One photo showed a doctor and health worker stitching a patient's head injury on a floor mat. Another photo showed a doctor wearing gloves as protective shoes before surgery. These are just some of the images critical of Uganda's healthcare system, part of an online campaign by popular cartoonist Jimmy Spire Sentongo. Just that they ignore, and maybe in ignoring things grow beyond what they can even comprehend, or they get to understand that this is happening in their aloof world, but that if this is cast out there, and maybe there is some little sense of shame left, they would feel bad about it. It was clear that they didn't want this voice to come out. For it to have come out that strongly was a triumph on our side. Sentongo's campaign under the hashtag Uganda Health Exhibition has also revealed allegations of understaffing and absenteeism, theft of drugs, abuse of patients, extortion and bribery. Sentongo has more than 175,000 followers on Twitter and the campaign has gained supporters, including those working in medical care, who joined the critical tweeting. Dr. Jacob Otile is a general practitioner. We are talking about a system that is already crumbling and then we look at the after effect of COVID. <laughs> if we need to make sure we move the next step, budgetary allocation to help us to significantly go high. Mismanagement of the little that we have, it ends up in people's pockets and corruption is one of the biggest, biggest problems. Uganda's Ministry of Health responded to the Twitter campaign by tweeting photos of clean hospital buildings with good medical facilities and blocking Sentongo's tweets. But the campaign led lawmakers like Joanna Lobo on Wednesday to discuss the health sector in parliament and share stories of problems from their constituents. A woman was taken for Sicilian section, but because the mother did not have money, three days after the operation, the woman started oozing out pus. When taken back to theater, there were particles left in the stomach. Uganda's Ministry of Health spokesman Emmanuel Ainebiona acknowledged to VOA there are problems in the healthcare system and blamed a lack of funding. We are not collecting as much as our revenue. So we are able to use the available resources to fix the urgent issues. And also, for them, they are focusing on the curative side. But also, we need to take interest and embrace the preventive uh, message. Things like sleeping under the mosquito nets, hand washing, doing physical activity. Sentongo and other activists are calling for an increase in the healthcare budget and better management of available funds. The Ugandan cartoonist launched another Twitter campaign earlier this month to fix the capital's poor roads under the hashtag Kampala Pothole Exhibition. It gained enough traction that authorities carried out road inspections, which led President Yoram Seveni to order $1.6 million to fix the roads. Halima Athmani for VA News, Kampala.